This is part three, William Dalrymple at the Sydney Writers' Festival. Horses haven't eaten for five days and they eat their breakfast as they eat their club to death by the gardeners. One man makes it through to Jalalabad. Dr. Bryden, the assistant surgeon, a Highland Scot, is good in the snow. He survives only because he's wrapped up in his forage cap a copy of Blackwood's magazine, a literary magazine, and in case he needs something to read at night, I don't know. When they strike at him, they, it goes through the leather binding of Blackwood's, but it doesn't go through his skull. And he arrives and General Sale comes out to meet him and says, where is the army? He says, I am the army. On our end, this is Best of the Festivals, and we're listening to William Dalrymple speaking at the 2013 Sydney Writers' Festival. His book, The Turn of a King, is a fresh account of the Anglo-Afghan conflict of 1839 to 1842. A strong wind was blowing from the south. Sail orders bugles and lanterns to be let put up on the battlements, but no one comes in. The terrible wailing sound of those bugles I will never forget. It was a dirge for our slaughtered soldiers. And heard throughout the night had an inexpressibly mournful and depressing effect. A few days later, five Gurkhas make it through. And then, bizarrely, a Greek merchant called Dr. Baness, who's presumably been sitting in a cave somewhere, so eating, drinking ouzo or metaxa or something, it turns up. But there's no one else. Everyone else is either captured or slaughtered or enslaved. And the Afghans are very methodical about this. The, <coughs> the officer class are kept, 150 officers, including my great uncle, Colin McKenzie, uh, are kept as hostages uh, because Das Muhammad and his harem are in India, and they need to get them back. The sepoys are divided in two. Those who are incapacitated through frostbite are stripped of their clothes and sent off into the snow naked to die. But worse still, the ones who are still able-bodied are taken off to the slave markets of Central Asia. And the Uzbek traders who run this trade have a particularly gruesome way with their prisoners. They take a carpet needle and they tie a camel hair rope through the clavicle of their prisoners. And your hands are tied behind your back and four or five of you are attached to a single saddle and off they ride. And if you don't keep up, stumbling with your hands tied behind your back, you have your entire chest frame ripped out. And they're taken away and the price of slaves in Central Asia plummets for a generation. There are so many, 5,000 sepoys are taken off to slavery. And those who escape, including Subhadar Bakh Khan, are the ones who start the Indian Mutiny in 1857. They've seen the English officers taken off to a cushy um, captivity, where they all sit there dressing up as Afghans waiting to be rescued, uh, while the poor old sepoys are, are left in slave markets or sitting in caves. Lady Sale, on her way to captivity, describes the sights she sees, the horrors. We passed 200 dead bodies, many of them Europeans, the whole naked and covered with large gaping wounds. As the day advanced, several poor wretches of Hindustanis, camp followers who had escaped the massacre of the night before, made their appearance behind rocks and within caves, where they'd taken shelter from the murderous knives of the Afghans and the inclemency of the climate. They had been stripped of all they possessed, and few could crawl more than a few yards on their hands and knees, being frostbitten in the feet. Here Johnson found two of his servants the one with his hands and feet frostbitten and had a fearful sword cut on one hand and a musket ball in his stomach. The other had his right arm completely cut off to the bone. Both were utterly destitute of covering, stark naked, and had not tasted food for five days. Wounded and starving, they'd set fire to the bushes and grass and huddled together to impart warmth. Subsequently, we heard that scarcely any of these poor wretches escaped from this defile. And driven to extremes of hunger, they sustained life by feeding off their dead comrades. So you've got scenes of cannibalism, slavery, unbelievable horror, but to the Afghans, this is their big national liberation struggle. Wazir Akbar Khan, 
is to the Afghans what Garibaldi and the Risorgimento is to Italy, what Washington and Yorktown is to the Americans, what Gandhi and the Salt Marches to the Indians, or Michael Collins and the Easter Rising. This is their big national liberation struggle, and the diplomatic quarter of Kabul is named after Wazir Akbar Khan to this day, while Shah Shuja's descendant and his family are regarded as the famed family of Quislings, the guys who sold Afghanistan down the river. Shah Shuja was the chief of the Popolzai tribe. The chief of the Popolzai tribe today is a man called Hamid Karzai. <laughs> so history has repeated itself in the kind of most <laughs> astonishing manner. Even the <coughs> micro-geography of the conflict. I, Henry Rawlinson, the guy we started with, the guy on the horse in the valley, he became governor of Kandahar during the occupation, and he keeps one of the best records. And I spent a lot of the last three years reading his, his terrible handwriting, trying to read his diary and his letters. I took a photocopy of some of those diaries to Kandahar when I went there. And we sat where he used to go in the evening to write his diary, on the shrine of Baba Wali, looking down at the Argandab Valley. And he described in the diary I was reading this pack of lancers with their scarlet cloaks coming down the hill to my right, where Mullah Omar's compound now is, the place where the, the famous laptop was found, which had all the details of the 9-11 operation. Coming down that hill, over the bridge of the Argandab and tilting their lances at the Durrani cavalry 300 yards further in. As I was reading it, this enormous pack of Humvees came grumbling down the hill with one of these space, sort of Star Wars vehicles the Americans have, anti-blast vehicles with convex bottoms that look like something out of a science fiction film. Rumbling down the hill over the bridge of the Argandab 300 yards in an IED goes off. So the kind of micro geography you still have the same towns garrisoned by foreign troops speaking the same languages, being shot at by the same tribes. The tribe, the Gilzai tribe, who shoot down the British in the Kulkabul Pass, today make up the foot soldiers of the Taliban. It's amazingly similar. Here is Mirza Atta, the best Afghan chronicler of the time. It is said that 60,000 English troops, half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting camp servants and followers, went to Afghanistan. And only a handful came back alive, wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them, and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money so much that they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. But what prize did they find in Afghanistan? Except on one hand, the exhausting of their treasury, and on the other, the disgracing of their army. It is said that 40,000 English troops have been in Kabul, that many were taken captive en route, others remained as cripples and beggars in Kabul, and the rest perished in the mountains, like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Khorasan. The English hoped to establish themselves in Afghanistan to block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended and all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. If the English had been able to take and keep Afghanistan, would they ever have left this land where 44 different types of grape grow and other fruit as well? Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, sweet watermelon and muskmelon, apricots and peaches and ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of India. These Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable japatis. <laughs> so that's Mirza Atta signing off on Indian cuisine. So, in order to research this book, I thought I had to do two things. I had to go to Afghanistan and dig out all the Afghan accounts. And this book is based largely on the Afghan version of events. The, Two epic poems, the Akbar Nama, <coughs> the Jang Nama, the uh, court histories, Shah Shuja's autobiography, all this fabulous stuff that has never been used in any English account today. It's impossible to imagine anyone would write a history of the Second World War without using German or Russian sources. But for much of British imperial history, people still, historians still, serious academic historians, still use only British accounts. And it's very easy to access this stuff. So I did four journeys to Afghanistan to get all this stuff. But I also thought in order to write it properly, you have to do the route of the retreat. It was clearly the 
going to be the emotional crux of the book. But it's difficult these days because Gundamuk, this last stand, that mountain behind is Torabora, the site of a different last stand more recently. And in order to do it, you have to go into the heart of Taliban territory. I couldn't see how he's going to do this. And then I had a lucky break. On my second night in Kabul, I got arrested by the chief of the secret police. And that isn't normally something that you relish, but on this occasion, I was pulled straight into the office of Amrullah Saleh, who was the head of the NDS, the, um, the uh, main Afghan security people. And Amrullah Saleh, it turned out, had read my last book, The Last Mogul, and didn't like it. This is a very bad book, he said. <laughs> you will do a better job this time. And in order to, in order to, uh, so sort of cross between interrogation and a bad book review, um, but it, there's no waterboarding, I'd like say the story. Anyway, he, instead, he kitted me out with, um, I know we've all read novels where we rather like to waterboard the author that go on. Anyway, but that's a different story. But the, so he kitted me out with this guy called Amwar Khan Jigdalik, who was the former captain of the Afghan Olympic wrestling team. It was about 20 foot tall by 18 feet wide. An enormous mountain of a man. And this guy was from Jigdalik, where the holly hedge um, was put up, where everyone got slaughtered in 1842. And that was his village. And he was a Hezbi Islami warlord at the time of the Mujahideen, had just come in uh, and joined Karzai's government. So we set off, bumping down the, past the site of the British Cantonment, which you won't be at all surprised to hear is now the site of the ISAF barracks and the American embassy. And up into the Kokobul, up the Tezin Pass, down to Jagdalik. And at Jagdalik, all Jagdalik's villagers came out and welcomed this guy, who was their big local hero. And we were about sort of 15 pickups by this stage, with lots of guys with guns and bandanas and all what have you, and rocket-propelled grenades. And they made an enormous feast for us all. They cooked, they killed a lamb, they put started kebabbing it all, mulberry right. And by about five in the afternoon, it was clear we were not going to get to Gundamuk. I was defeated, like my, so many of my compatriots were uh, in Afghanistan, but in my case, by the most enormous lunch I've ever eaten. Uh, and we had to head back to Jalalabad. But that evening, we found we'd had a very lucky break. Because that morning, from Jalalabad, the army and the police had gone out to destroy the poppy crop in Gundamuk. And there'd been an enormous battle on this hill that very day. Four policemen were killed, nine police vehicles were blown up, 90 hostages taken. And they brought the Taliban in, the villagers had brought the Taliban in to defend them. And the following day, we got the message in Jalalabad that the elders from Gundamak were coming in to negotiate. And they wanted Anwar Khan to, to be, their, uh, to be the, the middleman in the negotiations between the government and the villagers. So we went off to this hilltop near Jalalabad airport. And as this jirga was taking place, these drones were taking off from um, the airport pine. Jalalabad is one of the big centers of the drone campaign. And when you see drones in a Bourne movie, it's always one single drone with a bunch of guys in, in, in uh, um, CIA headquarters in, in shirt sleeves, you know, control. But in Jalalabad, it's like kind of, you know, a Sydney taxi rank or something. So uh, these things are taking off every five minutes. And these silent, sinister planes. And at the end of it, the elders came up and Amwar Khan introduced them to me. And we had this last conversation. And I said, you know, do you know about this war? Is it something that's still present? And they said, they all knew. Every illiterate old man in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, negotiating party knew the story. They said, whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now, they will face the fate of Burns and McNaughton. We are the roof of the world. From here you can control and watch everywhere. We're like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the strength to control our own destiny. And they told this story. One of them said, last month some American officers called us to a hotel in Jalalabad. One of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, this is the elder reply, because you blow down our doors, enter our houses, pull our women by the hair, and kick our children. We cannot accept this. We will fight back. And we will break your teeth. 
And when your teeth are broken, you will leave, just as the British and the Russians left before you. It's just a matter of time. What did he say to that, I asked? He turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? <laughs> In truth, all the Americans know their game is over here. It's just their politicians who deny it. This is the last days of the Americans, he said. Next, it will be China. Thank you. William Dalrymple concluding that session at the 2013 Sydney Writers Festival. You can find details on the Radio National website. Just follow the links to Best of the <coughs> Festivals. You'll also find the audio there and you can stream or download it. That's it for Best of the Festivals for now until summer. Okay, there you go. The history of what happens to people who try to invade Afghanistan. Australia's still got about a thousand people over there. We've had 42 of them killed in 10, 12 years, I think the figures are, something like that. I wonder what's going to happen before we all finally pull out of there and leave them to be. Warbles on the YouTube. Ciao.